Canada, the Great White North, the land of maple syrup, the home of many astounding Golden Age superheroes. Really? While the U.S. was going through their golden age of comics, the printing presses of the Great White North were inked up and rolling as well. The Canadian golden age of comics didn't start with the production of a single comic book. It started with the passing of a law. The passage of the War Exchange Conservation Act restricted importing of non-essential goods into Canada. And of course, this included pulp magazines and comic books. Small publishing houses set up shop across Canada. Being spread out and far from the center of the American comic book industry in New York City, Canadian creators drew from different inspirations and developed their own narrative voice. Early on, many of the Canadian funny books contained the adventures of realistic type heroes, Mounties, Lumberjacks, Native Americans, detectives, stories along those lines. In a very short time, the comic book industry began referring to Canadian comic books as Canadian Whites. This nickname came about because the interior pages in these comics usually consisted of simple line drawings with no color and limited shading. A few books contained two-tone art, but still most of the page remained white, thus giving them the name. At this time, they looked more like the comic books coming out of Great Britain than those coming out of the U.S. Vernon Miller and his Maple Leaf Publishing Company was the first Canadian publisher who attempted to fill the gap left by American comics. Maple Leaf was a small operation with Miller acting as both publisher and creative team. In 1941, he published Better Comics No. 1, which is considered to be the first Canadian comic book. As superheroes became the main attraction in U.S. comics, Canadian publishers took note and some publishers acquired the rights to reprint American comic characters. The original Captain Marvel became one of the best read characters in Canada. Anglo-American publishing reprinted the entire Shazam family of characters. And what makes these books interesting is that the Canadian publisher created new covers and often redrew or touched up the original stories they acquired from the American publisher. Of course, with the popularity of superheroes, Canadian readers wanted homespun superheroes of their own. Publishers were more than happy to give them what they wanted. Like in the U.S., a Canadian golden age of comics began. So now, it's time for a beer and a jelly donut, and a quick look at 10 golden age Canadian superheroes, eh? Iron Man is the first Canadian superhero. He was created in the Maple Leaf shop by Vernon Miller. In March 1941, he made his debut in the first issue of Better Comics. Iron Man was a swipe of Timely Submariner. In his story, he is the last of a race of aquatic supermen, and he lives at the bottom of the ocean in a magic bubble city. He attempts to steer clear of the surface dwellers, but he is dragged into world affairs. With Canada already deeply involved in the Second World War, Iron Man begins fighting the Axis. Many of his adventures have him fighting submarines and battleships. Nelvana is the daughter of a human mother and the Inuit god of the Northern Lights, Koliak. Nelvana is telepathic, and with her mind, she can melt metal and turn invisible. Her presence disrupts radio waves, and she also travels around on a ray of light. Being an Inuit native, many of Nelvana's stories are about outsiders coming into the frozen north and creating trouble. There's actually an interesting story behind this character. Nelvana was created by Adrian Dingle, and one of Dingle's close friends was an adventurer who had traveled across Canada, and he told Dingle all sorts of stories about the Inuit people and their stories and their legends. During his travels, he spent some time in a mining camp, and there the situation was rather bleak but there was a young girl who tried to keep camp spirits up. She cooked, she mended rib clothing, she chopped wood to keep fires going, she helped the sick. She did a lot of things to make life bearable. His friend referred to her as the Arctic Madonna. Of course, in case you hadn't guessed yet, her name was Nelvana.
Speed Savage was created by Ted Steele. And in a twist, Speed Savage is the alter ego of a dark avenger known as the White Mask. In his daily life, Speed is a criminologist. Only a few close friends like his assistant Veronica know what he does in his off hours. The publisher of Speed Savage was Bell Features. And in 1944, they had a contest asking readers to suggest story ideas. The winning idea came from a kid who suggested that they team speed up with another Bell Features superhero, Captain Wonder. From that point on, superhero team-ups became all the rage at Bell Features. Speed Savage and Captain Wonder team-ups became the norm, and other team-ups in the line soon followed. Canadian RAF pilot Phil Dauntless is stationed in Europe, in a country that gets overrun by the Nazis. Refusing to surrender, he goes underground and manages to steal an experimental seaplane called the Flying Fish. Dauntless continues his fight against the Nazis from wherever the fish will fly. Accused of desertion, he takes on the identity of Blackwing. In his adventures, Blackwing is joined by his co-pilot Hap and his girlfriend Dizzy. This character was created by Herb Free, and there were a number of stories as Phil Dauntless before he puts on the mask. From Blackwing, we now go to The Wing. The Wing was created by John G. Hilkert. Originally, she started off as a text-written character, Trixie Rogers, girl detective. And even though her stories were detective, her fictional job in these stories was that of a writer-cartoonist who draws a superhero strip called The Wing. A recurring gag is that Trixie's fictional real-life adventures are the inspiration for her fictional wing adventures. This storyline went on for a few issues until Trixie acquires a magic cape. And the cape gives her the powers of flight and super strength. And from that point on, she is her fictional character, The Wing. Creator John Hilkert joined the U.S. Army in 1943. The strip was taken over by 16-year-old Jerry Lazar. From there, Lazar would go on to become one of the most popular Canadian Golden Age artists. The covers of WoW comics would feature the exploits of The Penguin. This masked mystery man was the creation of Nelvana creator Adrian Dingle. In this storyline, Detective Bruce Barron puts on the odd-looking penguin hood to fight crime. Publisher Bell Features planned on selling comics in the U.S. market, but then found out about the Batman villain with the same name. Around the comic book industry, DC had a reputation for taking other publishers to court. To prevent any legal issues, Bell Features changed the character's name to The Blue Raven. However, they soon discovered that there was also an American comic called WoW, and that put a damper on their plans to land on American comic racks. In 1942, Bob Victor became Captain Wonder. The good captain became the lead feature in Triumph Comics. After his parents are killed, Bob Victor is raised by an Indian yogi. Growing up in a Himalayan temple for 20 years, Bob is taught valuable teachings hidden to most men. With word that the world is at war, the yogi sends Bob back to Canada. The yogi calls upon three ancient gods to give Bob the power to exterminate malignant doers. Captain Wonder was the creation of Ross Sackle. Sackle and artists like him are partially responsible for the negative reputation of Canadian comics. Canadian comic artists were known for tracing other artists' drawings and this was a very common practice during the Canadian Golden Age. Police Detective Terry Allen is Nitro. He is a non-superpowered Avenger who uses gadgets to fight crime. Nitro is the creation of 16-year-old Jerry Lazar, who I mentioned earlier also took over the wing, and he often teamed the two characters up together. Other than a lack of alter ego continuity, there's not a lot to really talk about this character, so I will take a moment to talk about his creator, Jerry Lazar. Lazar was 15 years old when he sent in some drawings to Bell Features. 
He was looking for tips to improve his artistic skills. And Bell Features publisher Cy Bell called him on the phone and said, come on in and get to work. And just like that, his career as an illustrator began. One of the most popular Canadian adventure series was Brock Windsor. Creator John St. Abels based this character on his adventure-loving friend whose real name happened to be Brock Windsor. The fictional Brock Windsor is a doctor and he's also an avid outdoorsman. He speaks several Native American languages and on weekends he enjoys canoeing in the wilds. While canoeing in Ontario, a strange mist approaches him. Windsor wakes up on the shore of a strange island and finds that he's grown to the height of seven feet tall. He discovers that the island is inhabited by a long forgotten tribe who happens to have advanced technology. Also on the island, he encounters all sorts of monsters and odd creatures. And finally, Mr. Monster is the creation of Fred Kelly. He made his first appearance in a 1946 issue of Triumph Comics. In earlier issues, his alter ego Doc Stern fought Nazis, but after the war, he found himself fighting werewolves, Frankenstein monsters, and vampires. Following the tone of his new adventures, Stern dons a full body costume and begins calling himself Mr. Monster. After World War II, Canadian publishers struggled. Publisher Bell Features sold the character to Howard Publications, and they printed Mr. Monster in their title, Super Duper Comics. In the 1970s, underground comic artist Michael T. Gilbert came across an old issue of Super Duper Comics. He fell in love with the character and began reworking the concept. He then acquired the rights and trademark for a relaunch, and in the mid-1980s, the new Mr. Monster was published under the Eclipse banner. Since then, the more humorous version of this character has remained in print on a somewhat regular basis. These 10 superheroes only represent part of the Canadian golden age of comics. There were many more not mentioned in this video. The Canadian comic book industry started with the passing of a law, and it died with the repeal of that law. The downfall of Canadian publishers happened very quickly. Canada ended the War Measures Conservation Act in 1946, and this allowed the importing of comics from the U.S. The Canadian whites were no competition to the full-color comics that came pouring across the border. To compound on the situation, film and radio had already established Canadian audiences for many American characters. Their fan base was already in place and ready to spend their money on them. Another shortcoming of Canadian comics was the level of art. It added to the notion that Canadian comics were inferior. In addition to most of them being in black and white, Canadian comics from this period get a very bad rap for the blatant tracing their artists did. At this time in the comics industry, tracing another artist's work was considered the lowest of the low. This practice is called swiping, and many of the top Canadian artists partook in this practice. All of this made it real easy for Canadian readers to dismiss Canadian comics. Publishers and their titles fell like trees cut down by lumberjacks. Canadian publishers got squeezed even further when American companies hired Canadian printers. By printing in Canada, they could avoid the import tax. This put even more U.S. comics on Canadian newsstands. Canadian comics largely went dormant until the 1970s. Then, a small number of indie publishers rose up. Like their predecessors, they had a different narrative voice that was far from the likes of mainstream American comics. With varying degrees of success, these small independent creators tried to launch their own comic universes. But that's a different story for a different time. Hi everyone, FizzFop here. And I hope you enjoyed this little story about the Canadian Golden Age. 
Um, this all started when I was bagging and boarding and organizing my collection, which is a total mess. And I came across the original Captain Canuck run from Comley Comics. I don't know if anybody remembers those, those guys or not. Um, but it got me into a deep dive, and I knew there were Canadian superheroes, but I really wasn't aware of the Canadian Golden Age until I started doing the research on this. I discovered a lot of really cool, interesting, and even bizarre characters I never knew existed. Anyway, I'm going to do another deep dive into Canadian comics that came out in the 1970s, and I'm hoping to find some real gems there. Uh, I sort of know about Comley Comics and Captain Canuck and some of the other stories that they brought out, but I'll let you know what I find in a future video. In the meantime, please hit the like button. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, that helps me out a lot with the analytics for YouTube. And uh, please make comments in the section down below. And yes, I do read every comment. You can also help the channel by supporting me on Patreon or making a one-time donation through PayPal. Every nickel is appreciated and your support helps create new content. The links are in the description box down below. Before I go, I want to send a big shout out to my favorite Canadian couple, Kev Dog and Diane. You guys are awesome. Thank you for the book. Um, they sent me a copy of uh, the great comic book superheroes from Jules Pfeiffer. And what's great about this book was I remember checking this book out at the library when I was a little kid. And uh, it was one of the books that started me on my love for the golden age of comics. This book has all the reprints of the classic characters like Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, Human Torch, and uh, so on. And it just tells their origin stories and stuff, and it's really cool. It's awesome. Thank you. I also have a big thank you for my friend Chris, who made a big donation on PayPal. Uh, I'm hoping to be able to buy a new computer soon, and maybe I can get more videos out faster. Well, that's all for me. So until next time, enjoy your Moosehead beer, and stay super. Bye.